or it's official, we're being recorded. Hey, uh, look, welcome everyone to our uh, last Kinder Institute uh, Pursuit of Happiness Hour colloquium of, of 2020. Um, uh, my name's uh, Jeff Pasley. I'm the Associate Director of the Kinder Institute uh, and uh, Professor of History here at the University of Missouri. I'm kind of being a little bit more formal than I am sometimes am because I think we have a quite a few uh, diff quite a few extra people than we sometimes do. Uh, that's great. Uh, but this, so, but uh, I'll just for those of you who are regulars, you may have a may may get a couple of re repeated remarks. Uh, unfortunately, you know, our pursuit of happiness hour in, in better times. In better times, we have a local brewery sponsors us and we have a whole reception. Unfortunately, these days we're mostly intellectual and online, uh, but maybe, you know, probably will be again next semester though we have a full thing, set of things things set up, uh, but there's always next year, there's always next year. Uh, so my understanding is we have some people who are not usually, don't usually tune into these. So let me first briefly explain before I, uh, introduce Mia Bay, let me briefly explain what the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy is, with apologies to our regulars. Founded in 2014, the, the Kinder Institute is a joint project between the University of Missouri Political Science and History Departments and the College of Arts and Science here at the University of Missouri, uh, in cooperation with other scholars across campus. It's dedicated to research, teaching, and community engagement on the subject of American political thought and history, seen in a broad global context and from a wide variety of perspectives. Our goal is to prepare students for the future of American democracy and Missouri democracy, whatever they may be, uh, by equipping them with knowledge of its past. Our hope at the Kinder Institute is to teach and learn about American constitutional democracy as the founders and their successors made it, but not just that. We want to understand the ideas that inspired the founders as well as those they disagreed with and over. We want to understand our republic's shortcomings as well as its accomplishments, the changes it has gone through, as well as its eternal truth. Hold on. I assume that wasn't nobody was talking to me. All right. Today we're very proud to have uh, as our guest uh, Professor Mia Bay. Uh, the Roy F. and Jeanette P. Nichols Professor of American History at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and Mia's going to discuss the uh, book project she's working on about the history of American, African American ideas about Thomas Jefferson. And she wanted to know it might be a little bit more broad than the one that, than, than what was of the, the abstract that was given. Uh, and this seemed to be a good way to me to kick off what I expect will be a long term occasional series of talks that we're probably going to call uh, here at the Kinder Institute, that we're probably going to call contextualizing Jefferson uh, in light of the ongoing discussion about the Jefferson Monument and statue uh, outside of the building where our offices are. Uh, but I should start out the introduction by mentioning that this is not actually even Professor Bay's current book project in the sense that most of us would use since most of us would use since I, I just discovered before the before we started that she has just turned in the proofs for one that's coming out in February, Traveling Black, A Story of Race and Resistance that's going to be published by about segregated travel and the segregation, seg Black people traveling in the, especially in the segregated era, segregation era uh, that's going to be published by uh, Harvard University Press and sounds like a major work that we should all plan to read. Uh, a couple other things about Mia before I turn it over to her. Uh, and I want to thank a uh, student, uh, Mary Grace Newman, actually, for, 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 uh, for actually compiling some information. We have our MA students in our, in our, uh, our, our, our Atlantic History MA program are, are actually, are, have actually been doing, they've been writing, they've been Writing about the speakers and then and then uh, and then responding to the speakers, you know, without in, within the class. Uh, so thanks to Mary Grace for for looking looking several things up. So, uh, uh, Mia grew up in Canada, got her BA at the University of University of Toronto. Uh, Tor Toronto. I wasn't I wasn't trying to. I was actually just slurring, not not being not trying to sound Canadian. Uh, uh, studied, did her PhD at, uh, at, uh, at Yale University under David Brian Davis, 
uh, in her first book based on her work there. It was called The White Image in the Black Mind, African-American Ideas About White People, uh, 1830 to 1925 from Oxford University Press. Uh, and then she's got a number of other works actually, uh, probably the biggest one besides the one that's coming out in February uh, is uh, To Tell the Truth Freely, The Life of Ida B. Wells uh, from Farrar, Strauss and Giroux in 2009. She also helped create, uh, curate one of the, the first exhibitions at the National, National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington. Uh, and as well as has a number of other a number of other uh, uh, grants, uh, lectureships, uh, and honors, including funding from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Humanities Center, uh, and the, the Charles Ward Center at Harvard, uh, and uh, a whole host of others. Uh, so, uh, and the, I guess the last thing the last thing that's probably to mention is that before she. Before she arrived to Penn, she was taught at Rutgers University and was director, director of the Rutgers University Center for Race and Ethnicity. So that's a lot of stuff. And there's actually quite a bit more to, that could be said about Mia, but we probably should leave her time to actually speak. Uh, so I'm going to say welcome to Professor Mia Bay and turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Professor Paisley. Um, I think I'd like to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint I'd like to share with you. So I'm just going to get that started. Um, share and here we go. Uh, is that working? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so I want to start with an image that's well outside the chronological boundaries of my talk today because it juxtaposes Thomas. This, I'm actually not on the right image, but um, because it juxtaposes Thomas Jefferson and Martin Luther King. As a slaveholder, Jefferson is a, is a figure that might be expected to be presented as little other than a villain in African-American thought, both past and present. Um, but in the image you see before you now, uh, the black artist Faith Ringgold invokes uh, Jefferson as a thinker who influenced black thought. Um, in crafting this picture, she was surely thinking of King's reference to Jefferson in his 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail in which King defended himself from white moderates who accused him of being an extremist by saying, was not Thomas Jefferson an extremist when he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal? In quoting Jefferson, I would argue, King participated in a, tradi a tradition of African-American engagement with Jefferson that goes all the way back to the revolution and is particularly notable in the antebellum era. Um, if you survey antebellum black newspapers, for example, Jefferson is the founding father who is most often quoted and invoked and discussed um, and often in positive, if ambivalent terms. Um, and I have another slide that I actually need to update that um, is in a survey of a, one particular database of antebellum black newspapers and kind of gives you the proportion of the founding presidents who are discussed and quoted. And as you see, Jefferson figures very prominently. Um, in fact, the only early president to receive anywhere near, to be mentioned anywhere near as often as John Quincy Adams, um, who had a long and distinguished record of anti-slavery activism. Um, yet these discussions, these African-American discussions of Thomas Jefferson have gone largely unnoticed by both Jefferson scholars and historians of African-American thought. Um, Historians of African-American thought tend to focus on black nationalism while scholarship on Jefferson tends to more focus on Jefferson's views of African-Americans than the other way around. Uh, recent commentary on Sally Hemings notwithstanding. So this book project that I'm currently working on is an attempt to explore and explain the curiously central role of Jefferson in black thought. Um, it will argue that there's no simple way to summarize the status of Jefferson in African-American thought. 
Um, on the one hand, he is revered as the author of the Declaration of Independence um, and is often invoked as an authority for the, about the nation's highest ideals as we see in the Martin Luther King letter. Um, but on the other hand, black thinkers are generally speaking far from uncritical of Jefferson, um, so much so that at least one scholar who's previously looked at the question of black thought on Thomas Jefferson has dismissed it as uh, black views of Jefferson as essentially negative in obvious and unsurprising ways. Um, what I find is that the reality is both more complicated and more interesting. Jefferson is both celebrated and abhorred in Black thought. Um, and one reason that he's so central is precisely because he's a compelling symbol of the national contradictions at play in a democracy undercut by racial, uh, by slavery and racial prejudice. Jefferson becomes a hero to both pro and anti-slavery forces after his death in 1826. Um, um, and is known even in his own lifetime as a man who's self-contradictory and conflicted on the subject of slavery. Um, so of course he, he, he becomes intriguing for both um, Republican and Democratic parties after his death. They claim him as the father of their opposing views on slavery. Um, he remains a national icon um, for both sides even after his death on, on the issue of slavery because his, his views on slavery are so difficult to pin down um, as the author of the Declaration of Independence, both the Declaration of Independence and notes on the state of Virginia, Jefferson always had the dubious distinction of laying claim to one, to one of the most egalitarian endorsements of human rights of his era while also producing one of the earliest articulations of scientific racism, earliest American articulations in any case. And he's no more consistent in his actions than his words. Um, he supports the ban on slavery in the Western territories covered by the North, Northwest Ordinance of 1787. He presides over the 1808 abolition of the slave trade, but he's a fierce opponent of the Haitian Revolution. He never supports abolitionism. He frees only a handful of the hundreds of slaves he owns over the course of his lifetime. Um, and in recent years, the rumors that he fathered at least one child with his enslaved uh, house servant Sally Hemings have further underscored his reputation as a man whose ideals and actions cannot be easily reconciled. African Americans were fascinated, I argue, by Thomas Jefferson, not despite, but rather because of the contradictions in his thought, which they often discuss. Um, indeed, perhaps of all antebellum African Americans, free blacks most fully appreciated the expansive range of Thomas Jefferson's contradictory ideas about race. They found in them a juxtaposition between American ideals and racial realities that spoke to the paradoxes of the African-American experience and could be crafted into a mandate for racial justice. Um, by sustaining an enduring critical engagement with Jefferson as a flawed symbol of American democracy, African-American thinkers um, place their community's freedom struggles squarely within the American political tradition. In doing so, they departed from Jefferson's own script about African-American thought. Jefferson was convinced that slavery destroyed the amor patri of the enslaved, of black people, and insisted that if a slave could have any country in the world, it must be any other in preference to that in which he is born to live and labor for another. Um, African-Americans rejected this idea um, and dismissed it as wishful thinking on the part of a slaveholder who maintained that if freed blacks must be removed uh, beyond the reach of mixture. Jefferson's notion that African-Americans felt no love of country betrayed a poor understanding of the political convictions of African-Americans of his own day, 
um, who wove their freedom struggle around a commitment to an American nation founded on the democratic ideals that Jefferson himself had written into the foundations of the Republic when he drafted the Declaration of Independence. Um, accordingly, from the American Revolution onward, Jefferson was deeply meaningful to African Americans as the founding father of a nation that took shape around an ideology of natural rights and personal freedom to which Black Americans dearly hoped to lay claim. Um, indeed, before 1776 was out, the preamble to the Declaration of Independence entered African American political thought, figuring on the front page of the most detailed African American's consideration of the conflict. Um, that was um, Lemuel Haynes's Liberty Further Extended, which was a manuscript uh, written by um, an African American from Massachusetts um, drafted by hand. It was it was not never published and only discovered relative in sometime I think in the 1980s in manuscript form. Um, but it was a contemporary critique of the limits of American independence. Um, and it included under its title, the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, which you see written at the bottom of the, of the page. Um, in citing the declaration, Hemings, who had served in the who served with the Minutemen in Massachusetts before becoming ill and being discharged, uh, wrote as a patriot, um, and he wrote as a patriot hope to redefine the goals of the revolution to include black freedom, as would um, revolutionary era slaves whose freedom positions would also likewise make reference to the declaration's stirring preamble. In citing the declaration, Haynes and other blacks, both slave and free, who petitioned for black liberty in the new nation from 1776 onward, did not initially talk directly to Jefferson since his, his authorship of the declaration and the document itself um, received little press in the years immediately following the revolution. But by the 1790s, blacks along with other Americans would begin to see the document very much as Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. So African-Americans are in dialogue with Jefferson's ideas from the beginning and then from this, by the 1790s they're actually attaching them very much to Jefferson, um, which poses new challenges um, because educated blacks of the early national period could not but help juxtapose Thomas Jefferson's broad and universal language of liberty in the Declaration of Independence with both his status as a slaveholder and his comments on black inferiority published on the notes, published in his notes on the state of Virginia, the only full length book he published during his lifetime. Oh, I forgot to show you one image. Uh, this is an image of Lemuel Haynes who um, after he, uh, after the revolution would ultimately go on to become a minister in Vermont. Uh, this is just an image of him preaching from Vermont. And then notes on the state of Virginia, I provide an example of here. Um, this famous text was written between 1782 and 1783, anonymously published in Paris initially, not published in English until 1787. Um, and um, it attracts almost immediate attention from African Americans who begin to wrestle with its contradictions. Um, the first African American to address Jefferson's suspicion articulated notes on the state of Virginia that blacks are utterly inferior to whites in the endowments of body and mind is of course Benjamin Banneker. Um, who a lot of you may have heard of. He was a free black who lived in Maryland. Um, Banneker made his living as a farmer, but he was also a self-taught mathematician, astronomer, and surveyor of some note who worked for the survey team that mapped out the District of Columbia. Um, the surveying of the capital took place under the supervision of Andrew Ellicott, who was Banneker's friend and neighbor. He was a Quaker who appreciated Banneker's talents and employed him 
to monitor the telescopes and other navigational instruments that his team used to plot the district's boundaries by latitude. Working mostly at night, Banneker spent several months in a surveyor's camp on the Potomac, collecting and calculating data for Ellicott. Um, he was considered a remarkable man for this job, uh, so much so that his arrival in Georgetown was notable enough to be featured in the town's weekly ledger. Ellicott, the ledger noted, arrived in town to begin his survey, accompanied by an Ethiopian whose abilities as a surveyor and astronomer clearly proved that Mr. Jefferson's concluding that that race of men were void of mental endowments was without foundation. Banneker clearly agreed with this assessment. Although a quiet, largely apolitical individual who discussed, who otherwise discussed a little bit science, um, Banneker would go on uh, to make the same point about black equality to Jefferson after returning from his work at, in the District of Columbia. With the help of one of Ellicott's friends, Banneker published an almanac at the end of 1791. Um, it drew on the measurements that he made while surveying the district to plot and plotted the motions of the sun and the moon, the true places and aspects of the planets, conjunctions, ellipses, judgments of weather and festivals, while also containing the court calendars for Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. Um, it was a useful reference book, which would be a bestseller and go through several editions. Um, and it would also stand as further proof of Banneker's gifts. On its publication, Banneker sent Jefferson an advanced copy accompanied by a letter that challenged him to live up to its egalitarian, his egalitarian ideals. He in the letter, he praises Jefferson's revolutionary spirit but at the same time says he finds it pitiable that the author of the Declaration of Independence should at the same time be found guilty of that most criminal act which you professedly detest in others. Banneker offered himself up as a living rebuttal to theories of black inferiority, going so far as to send Jefferson a handwritten copy of the almanac, but that you might view it in my own handwriting. Jefferson's response to Banneker, while outwardly cordial and supportive, illustrated how difficult it would be for African Americans to prove their equality to unsympathetic whites. Um, despite his insurances to Banneker that nobody wishes more than I do to see proofs such as you exhibit that nature has given our black brethren talents equal to those of other men, Jefferson was privately unconvinced. In a letter to a friend written several years later, Jefferson maintained that Banneker probably wrote his almanac only with the help of a white neighbor and had a mind of very common stature indeed. All the same, more black challenges to Jefferson would pro proliferate as, Northern, as the Northern free black population expanded in the wake of the revolutionary era emancipation acts. The turn of the century saw free blacks attack slavery and discrimination in the North and also condemn the disquieting tendency among whites to stigmatize us, as Banneker put it, as men whose baseness is incurable. In response to Jefferson, free blacks both critiqued and celebrated him, crafting an ever more complex response to the founding fathers' contra contradictory ideas and actions. Um, and these grew more contradictory um, as Jefferson became more powerful and well-known. As president um, elected in the famous election of 1800, um, Jefferson would preside over the end of the slave trade in 1808, um, yet um, an event which would be celebrated by free blacks across the nation Yet even as they celebrated the end of the slave trade as a triumph of Jeffersonian principles, the Jeffersonian principles of freedom and equality, these African-Americans would continue to be haunted by the arguments for black inferiority in the notes in the state of Virginia. Uh, one of the most 
intriguing and least known black or at least possibly black discussions of Thomas Jefferson from this early time period is an 1808 letter from, to Jefferson from an author who simply signs, signs himself a slave that is filed in Jefferson's private papers. Um, 24 pages long, it's an often angry critique of Jefferson's failure to live up to its own ideals. Um, it was only recently dug out from Jefferson's papers. Its author cannot be identified and could at least theoretically be anyone, including a white writer posing as a slave. Uh, but the historian Thomas N. Baker, who recently <coughs> rediscovered the letter, um, contends that while the kind of racial ventriloquism of pretending to be black in a, in a letter is sometimes adopted by white writers of that time period, it's usually far more sentimental in tone than it was in the slave's letter and appropriations of black identity um, in the early national period is usually a public pose and the letter is anonymous. Again, we can't, we can't be sure who wrote this letter, but interestingly, Jefferson seems to think that the writer was in fact a slave. He labeled the letter anonymous, a Negro slave, November 30, 08, um, before filing with the rest of his papers. He never replied to it, and his only further comment on it was to label it a rhapsody of inconsistencies. Uh, the letter itself is not particularly hard to follow. Like Banneker, uh, the writer appeals to Thomas Jefferson as a man who has a record of public anti-slavery utterances who has failed to live up to his own principles. Um, writing in 1808, its author hopes that Jefferson will follow up on his abolition of the slave trade with the abolition of slavery in the United States and appeals to him to do so um, by citing Jefferson's own critique of slavery notes and appealing to him as a revolutionary fellow American. Uh, the writer says, oh, rise up brave sons of 76 and the children of those heroes who bleed and died to free their country from foreign foes and from bondage, that we and our children might live free from foreign as well as domestic tyrants. Don't let their labors be lost. Don't let so much blood be spilt in vain. Similar appeals to Jefferson would appear in a variety of early African-American texts, including Daniel Coker's dialogue between a Virginian and an African-American minister, which was published in 1810. Born in Maryland in 1720, I think I might have that date wrong. Um, Coker was a former slave who escaped to New York City as a teenager. There he joined a Methodist church as a lay minister before returning to Maryland after a Quaker friend purchased his freedom. The di his dialogue between a Virginian and an African-American minister is perhaps the earliest anti-slavery tract written by an African-American and the only such document I can think of that was published in a slave state. It combines natural rights arguments uh, with arguments drawn from the Bible to refute pro-slavery claims of slavery's divine sanction um, and also claims about black inferiority and the supposed inevitability of race war should slaves be free. Uh, it's a very diplomatic text, but in many respects it is an argument with Thomas Jefferson, um, who had only recently retired to Monticello after serving two terms as president of the United States. Uh, the text consists largely of a dialogue between an African minister who was presumably Coker himself and an imaginary Virginia slaveholder who cites the prospect of race war and a fear of miscegenation as impediments to emancipation as Jefferson does in notes on the state of Virginia. Um, but rather than addressing that text, uh, Coker instead presents Jefferson as an anti-slavery figure dodging any 
critique, direct critique of Jefferson. He praises him as the late president of the United States who shall ever be remembered in my prayers for the abolition of, of the slave trade. While Coker goes on to argue that the domestic slave trade is equally cruel, you would not know from reading Coker's pamphlet that Jefferson is a slaveholder who shares many of Coker's imaginary interlocutor's views. Um, his text cites notes on the state of Virginia only once, um, and then it is to recommend the plan that Jefferson outlines in notes um, for the um, for the abolition of slavery, um, it's sort of gradual emancipation plan that Jefferson outlines and notes that, that would have made colored children free at a certain age. Unlike Jefferson, though, um, Je in, in sort of outlining this plan, Coker does not call for the colonization of emancipated slaves, but instead suggests that adult slaves should be allowed to purchase themselves. His pamphlet ends happily with the African minister persuading the Virginian to go home and emancipate his slaves, much as Coker himself might have hoped to persuade Jefferson to do. So here we have someone talking about Jefferson and kind of dealing with all the contradictions directly and indirectly. And this is something that you would see continue um, somewhat more cynical and Critical of Jefferson um, was another interlocutor, a black New Yorker named William Hamilton, who was a carpenter and abolitionist, who ironically enough was at least rumored to be the illegitimate son of Jefferson's great rival, Alexander Hamilton. Um, Hamilton gave a couple of orations, one in 1809, another in 1827, in which he commemorated the end of slavery, end of the slave trade, but blasted the notion that African Americans are inferior to white men in the structure of both body and mind. Again, he's in dialogue with notes on the state of Virginia. Um, even more circumspect than Coker, in some respects, Hamilton never mentions Jefferson by name or cites notes. Um, but he discusses it all the same, presenting a devastating critique of Jefferson's arguments in that work. In his speeches, he works his way through Jefferson's critique of Black people, dismissing his claims of Black bodily inferiority as below our notice, um, and um, also addressing uh, Jefferson's critique of Phyllis Wheatley, which I've just put up here. Uh, on, the, on the screen, um, uh, Hamilton dismisses this as an utterly frivolous assessment of the intellectual abilities of Blacks. Um, moreover, he's critical of Jefferson's own intellectual limitations, highlighting the inconsistencies in his thought. Um, and here I'll show you his most striking assessment. Um, in which he says, I know I ought to speak with more caution, but when an ambidexter philosopher who can reason contrary wise first tells you that all men are created equal and that they are endowed with the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and next proves that one class of men are not equal to each other, which by the by does not agree with the axioms of geometry that deny that things can be both equal, be equal and yet unequal to another. Suppose such a philosopher should keep around him a number of slaves and at the same time tell you that God hath no attribute to favor the master in the case of the insurrection of slaves. Does he reason like a man of high moral principle? Does he act in conformity with true philosophy? Hamilton's questions, which are obviously very pointedly addressed to Jefferson, um, may have addressed Jefferson's sexual behavior as well as his philosophy. Um, uh, it was an issue that Coker also raised in his pamphlet, which maintained that the responsibility for amalgamation lay almost wholly with white men, as black men rarely took white wives. Um, and this is an issue that has, has become public ever since um, uh, 
since the early 1800s when stories about Jefferson and Sally Hemings first become circul first began to circulate um, and it figures in these pamphlets and it will figure in black thought. Coker's um, African minister said, uh, said a decade or so after the federal press had first accused um, Jefferson of keeping his slave Sally Hemings as a concubine. Coker muses that some white men of high rank who profess abhorrence to such connections have been first in the transgression. And Hamilton makes similar observations, which come almost immediately after his pointed discussion of Jefferson. Um, without really leaving the subject of Jefferson, Hamilton goes on to know that there is a universal fear of amalgamation among white men, which does not keep them pursuing, from pursuing black women. Despite their anxieties that the pretty white will be changed thereby to a dingy mulatto, he writes, white masters do amalgamate the blood. The worst of it, he further charges, is not the amalgamation, but the fact that white masters hold their children as slaves and sell them as such. His words speak to the Hemings I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, both of these charges he mentions are charges that are made against Jefferson in the aftermath of the Hemings scandal. Um, although they do not derail his reelection or even bring him much public disapprobation um, or, or receive any kind of widespread credence until recently. Um, Instead, that the Hemings scandal um, is something that Jefferson is sort of mocked for by his white Federalist critics. Um, there's cartoons, there po there's sort of poetic ditties about um, Hemings and Jefferson. Um, here's one of the cartoons that portrays Jefferson as a preening rooster. Um, all of these things were likely familiar to Blacks from the time, and we can kind of see them in the background of uh, Coper's pamphlet and Hamilton's pamphlets. Um, Hamilton uh, may well be referring to Jefferson when he ultimately concludes that um, it is said by a Frenchman of high note that an American will sell his dog for money. I do not know that a Frenchman will not do the same, but I do know this, that white men sell children of their own begetting for sordid gold. Um, this is a charge against Jefferson um, uh, that becomes a sort of common version of the Hemming scandal in 18, or the Hemming story in anti-slavery circles over time. Um, there will become a sort of story about Jefferson the daughter of Jefferson being sold in New Orleans for $1,000. Um, the story is kind of strikingly different from the initial version of the story, which focuses more on a relationship between Jefferson and Hemings. Um, and in many ways, it's more damning since um, not only does it involve the sale of a child, but New Orleans is the center of the fancy trade. So there's the implication that he, the child is sold into not just slavery, but perhaps sexual slavery. Um, I mentioned all this just to underscore that such stories were clearly well known among free blacks. Um, they, uh, refer to them explicitly in a variety of print sources in the years after the Hemming, the Hemming story becomes public. Um, but interestingly, they don't become a central theme in Black discussions of Thomas Jefferson. Um, Hamilton, in many ways, is a case in point. He does blast slave masters for selling their mulatto children. Um, oh, but he does so without explicit reference to Jefferson, and he makes a far more direct critique of what of the man he calls the ambidexter philosopher um, for holding slaves. 
Uh, meanwhile, other subsequent critiques of Jefferson make even less reference to Hemings, antebellum black newspapers, such as the Colored American, the North Star, Frederick Douglass's paper in the Christian Recorder, feature the Hemings stories just often enough to give us good reason to believe that it's a story with which many African Americans are familiar, but it doesn't become a big story in the black press. Um, black writers instead tend to treat the story briefly, carefully, and often in fictional form. Um, to give a few examples, Jefferson's imagined offspring is featured in a sketch of a newsboy by one black writer um, who describes this newsboy as po a possible descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Old Sal. Um, and the Hemming story is um, a theme, a prominent theme in one of the earliest African American novels, William Wells Brown's Clotel, um, which I have here, um, which was published in 1853 um, and actually published under a different title in the United States. This is the British edition. Um, I've wondered why this is sort of, this story is sort of gets a relatively low pro profile in black thought. And I think one reason might be that it's very difficult to speak about um, in an era where black male abolitionists rarely um, discuss the sort of issue of um, black women and slave owners. Discussions of Hemings may have been considered in politic, um, or on the other hand, I think rumors of Jefferson's involvement with the slave women may have also simply struck many African Americans as unremarkable in a slave holding republic where uh, William Hamilton, Frederick Douglass, and many other free blacks were the product of such unions. Uh, certainly one, one commentator I found on it, Jacob Green, a fugitive slave who mentions the Hemming story in his Civil War era na narrative seems to come to this conclusion in his brief reference to the relationship. Jefferson Green writes, um, at once said, I tremble for this country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. Um, his words, Green thought, showed very clearly that the people of America do not commit this sin in the dark, but are perfectly conscious when they are perpetuating it of the enormity of the crime. Even this man, speaking as he did, sold his own daughters, which he had as had by his slaves for the vilest purposes. Um, but Green mentions this in passing, but also does not dwell on this point. Um, Instead, by the antebellum era, Jefferson is more important in Black thought as an icon of the promise and failings of American democracy than he is as a man who could be indicted for sleeping with one of his slaves. Um, few doubted that he did so, but Blacks, um, but the Blacks who mobilized around the abolitionist era in the antebellum years um, found other questions about Jefferson to be more important. Jefferson was most useful, I think, to African-American thinkers as an anti-slavery icon who failed to live up to his principles. Um, in particular, as Blacks mobilized around abolitionism in the late 1820s, um, they began to really draw on Jefferson as an anti-slavery icon whose image was all the more powerful um, precisely because of his failure to live up to it. Um, and by this point, Jefferson's anti-slavery principles maybe are perhaps more important than they had ever been before. Um, because uh, by this point, um, Jefferson's successors in the South are rallying around a pro-slavery ideology that leaves no recognition for Black freedom. Um, Jefferson is this icon of American democracy that does embrace anti-slavery to some extent, and he becomes most useful to Black thinkers as someone to prop up this idea. Um, his story and the ways in which he doesn't live up to his ideals um, 
also make him a good symbol of America. As Annette Gordon Reed has noted, Jefferson is flawed in much the same manner as America itself. Um, and these flaws make him for an ideal foil for black leaders bent on exposing the contradictions of a democratic republic that is only half free. Um, he's a figure who lends himself to pro both anti and pro-slavery readings um, and is alternately a hero and a whipping boy in black thought, often both at the same time. The Jeffersonian document that black thinkers invoke most often was of course the Declaration of Independence, which they frequently read as evidence that America was a nation founded on principles antithetical to slavery. Um, and um, by the 1820s and 30s, you have black thinkers such as Connecticut abolitionist and minister Jose Easton um, presenting slavery and racial discrimination as an utter betrayal of the politics of the revolutionary era. Um, Easton would emphasize that the Continental Congress met without ever discussing discrimination on the basis of color, that blacks fought in the revolution alongside whites, um, and that According to Easton, there is no indication in the rhetoric of the Founding Fathers or the Declaration of Independence that colored people are not recognized as citizens. Um, and writing in this way, Easton and some other Black thinkers sometimes idealize the Founding Fathers, not just Jefferson, but all of them. Um, but they're also arguing for sort of the inclusion of African Americans in the founding in a way that has um, has some merits and deals and sort of invokes ideals of the revolutionary era that are actually more liberal than their own era. Uh, yet even as they begin to make Jefferson into a kind of anti-slavery founding father, they never entirely let him off the hook. It doesn't, they don't give a blanket endorsement of them, of him. This can be most clearly seen in the writings of the famous black abolitionist David Walker, whose fiery abolitionist tract um, appeal to the colored citizens of the world appear, first appeared in 1829 um, and is alternately inspired and enraged by notes from the state of Virginia. Um, Walker both condemns Jeff Jefferson and cites the declaration as a license for black rebellion. Walker was a black Boston clothing merchant deeply committed to improving the status of his people. Um, and he saw Jefferson as an important icon of white American contradictions about race, a figure who gave a voice and a name to some of white America's most racist assumptions while at the same time articulating the principles by which all Americans could live. Um, his appeal was an attack on slavery, colonization, and racial discrimination. Um, and it included a rallying cry to African Americans to refute Jefferson's claims of Black inferiority on, in notes on the state of Virginia. Um, he encouraged, in particular, Blacks to refute these claims themselves according to their chants. Um, and he does this in notes on the state of Virginia with a sharp critique of Jefferson's suspicions that blacks might be originally a distinct race, as well as his low assessments of black capacities. To Walker, all of these ideas illustrate the evils of the American slave sy system, which produced a sort of ignorant and avaricious color prejudice um, that went beyond anything that had existed in the human history. Um, yet at the same time, he draws on Jefferson's ideas. Um, he argues that the slave's right to revolt rests on Jeffersonian principles um, and that the, li the license to rebellion is contained in the declaration itself. Um, Do you not understand your own language, he says? All men are created equal. Um, and then he kind of goes through the declaration as license to revolt. Perhaps more than 
Any other document of the antebellum era, Walker's appeal demonstrates that Jefferson's contradictions could provide African-Americans with a mandate for change. His arguments about black inferiority could be answered. The Declaration of Independence could be read as a call for a slave revolt. And Jefferson's visions of race war could be transformed into an oppressed people's goals. Subsequently, over the course of the antebellum era, Jefferson was increasingly cast as an anti-slavery figure in the writings of both black and white opponents of slavery. As the sectional controversy snowballed, pro-slavery forces marshaled Jefferson in support of each new controversy, mining his mixed record on the peculiar institution in support of their own views. Um, among Blacks, however, these kind of strategic readings of Jefferson came alongside continuing critiques of his racist ideas and practices. Um, as I mentioned previously, the Heming story never dies among African Americans. Um, and the racist sentiments that Jefferson expressed in notes in the state of Virginia remain still more prominent. Starting in the 1830s, um, Blacks really begin to take up some of the sort of Science, scientific side of that document, the sort of naturalist notions about race. Um, this is an era when both blacks and whites are begun to write about ethnology, um, which was also the science of race. Um, and you have black ethnologists beginning to take on allegations of black inferiority at length, including those made by Jefferson. Um, in this literature, um, Authors such as James W.C. Pennington and James McCune Smith uh, begin to present extended critiques of um, Jefferson's racial thought. Um, so here um, you have um, Smith's publication in the Civil War era publication of an extended critique of notes on the on the uh, notes on the state of Virginia, the Fourteenth Query, which is where he Jefferson makes his arguments about black inferiority. Um, a physician by training, Jefferson uh, McCune Smith draws on his medical knowledge to show that the physical distinctions between blacks and whites present no permanent bar to their coexistence. Um, but in the end, his real quibble with Jefferson is political. Um, he, uh, he says the real question is, what does Jefferson mean when he says, we the people? Um, and he argues that in Jefferson's time, we the people did mean all men, that all men were endowed with certain inalienable rights um, and um, that we the people had a profound sublime imp imp impact, import. Um, it meant both black and white as could be seen in the North where men were raised by public voice to the dignity and privileges of citizenship. Um, so he both critiques Jefferson, but also tries to lay claims to the most expansive and universal of the principles that Jefferson articulated. Um, as the work of Smith and others shows, um, Jefferson was a lodestar in antebellum black thought precisely because he was so conflicted and self-contradictory on the subject of slavery. Um, for all that his commitment to emancipation was purely theoretical and, and hinged on an unrealistic plan to resettle blacks outside the United States, Jefferson's hope that slavery would someday end gave power to antebellum blacks who wished to argue that that day was now. Um, in evoking Jefferson and his temporizations, antebellum era black could place the ab place abolition within the revolutionary tradition and assert that the founding fathers with all their inconsistency had the grace to confess the abhorrent character of slavery and hopefully predict its overthrow and complete extirpation. Moreover, Jefferson's contradictories were profoundly useful. Jefferson's contradictions, excuse me, were profoundly useful to African-American abolitionists. 
In Jefferson, they found a figure whose life and thought underscored the inconsistencies between slavery and democracy and between race and right race and rights and trembled for his country because they knew that, because he knew that God was just. Um, Jefferson was particularly important to the African-American anti-slavery critique during the antebellum era and he would become less important in black thought after emancipation, uh, which is one reason why his central place in antebellum black thought has gone largely unrecognized. After the war, he was almost immediately displaced by Lincoln, who after his assassination became the martyr figure around African American, around whom African Americans would discuss their place in American history, as well as the precarious status of a free people. Um, but Jefferson's lingering influence can be seen in some African American discussions of Lincoln, which almost combine the two men. The most vivid example, which I'll close with, um, is comes from a late from a late 19th century emancipation proclamation day poster celebrating black progress progress. Um, this poster is dominated by a seated Lincoln figure holding a document, but the document is not in fact the emancipation proclamation. If you look at it closely, you'll see that it's the Declaration of Independence and it shows the ways in which both Lincoln and Jefferson kind of morph into one as these black liberators that liberate African Americans without fully providing them the freedoms laid out by American democracy. I think I'll stop there and be happy to take questions. See, look at that. I, I'm not even unmuted myself. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife just told me that, that I was unmuted. Uh, I, I was muted. Uh, so, well, so Mia, uh, we have a couple questions here. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start out with. I wonder, one if you, I, I wondered, I wondered if you were would had any inclination to take the story up to the present because it seemed like this is actually things are changing in this in this area as we go along um, um, in this in the sense that and I guess that's to bring it to some of our local stuff is that Je I don't know if Jefferson's important but it seems as though the the kind of mixed view that you're talking about uh, it's and, and, and I would have said that that was that seemed to be true even 20 years ago and it seems like it's changed in this this century um yeah, I mean, I, there's a variety of reasons. I think um, I, I, you know, I have thought about taking it up to the present. I mean, Jefferson kind of doesn't get that much attention in Black Thought between um, shortly after Lincoln's death and around the 1960s. But he, you know, he he's he is a prominent. I mean. Martin Luther King talks about him. Obama makes multiple references to him. Um, there, 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 you know, there, there is definitely an argument for for going further. This, this sort of started. This, this project was kind of a, a spinoff from my first book, The Black Image and the White Mind, which is very much a 19th century book, which is maybe why I've kind of thought about it in 19th century terms. But I think there is an argument for for going going to the present day um, and that I will, I will definitely have a, an epilogue, but it could grow into a chapter or hopefully not more <laughs> as I continue working on this book. Well, yeah, you can, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've got some statue saga stuff here. If you need, <laughs> yeah. if you need any material. Oh. Um, <laughs> so let's see, we usually start with a student question about several. Hey. Uh, how about Morgan? Morgan, you had the first question way back. Yes, I, sorry about that. I was. Uh, That's okay. Yeah, I took you by surprise. I should have been. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Bay, for this conversation. Um, I, when I was an undergrad, I did a project on Thomas Jefferson, um, so this helped fill in a lot of the gaps for me. And of course, I 
you know, live in Missouri, so I can't get away without asking about the Missouri Compromise. And I was just wondering what response, if any, there was to Jefferson um, calling the Missouri Compromise, the knell of the Union. I know that it was originally like private hey. correspondence, um, but I don't know like if there was any reaction to that at all. You know, I haven't seen any African-American commentary on that particular utterance by Jefferson. And, and that could be partially, you know, just because, you know, black newspapers are not really up and running by that time. Um, but no, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think there's much of a discussion of the Missouri Compromise. That Mia, this I say I have a I have a self interested interjection because mm -hmm. I've been working on this this uh, Missouri crisis bicentennial thing with mm -hmm. Rick Hammond and we've actually really struggled to find uh, uh, not even not uh, black commentary on on Jefferson but just on the Missouri right yeah and from the time you know there's some later there's there's some. Uh, obviously people to talk about later, but uh, from the time that's been a real struggle to find that. You yeah. Know any, do you? <laughs> yeah, no, that it's, it, that's a real challenge though. I mean, doesn't it figure in one of the slave rebellions like discuss debates over the Missouri Compromise? Yeah, well, it does in the, the, the Denmark Basey, I think mm -hmm. it comes up. That's the closest one. So there, yeah, there's, there's lots of, there's, Plenty of ex post facto things that we're trying to like have responses at the time, and it's been very. It's not always people don't always, as you say, the the fact that the black press hasn't started yet creates creates problems. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Evan Toriano, call yourself up, Evan. Great. Hi. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your talk, Professor Bay. The the question I wanted to ask was whether you could just speak a little more about the uh, um, how the how the sort of move among uh, black anti slavery activists to embrace uh, Jefferson and and his rhetoric that you sort of tie to the starting in the late eighteen twenties how it maybe relates to a larger like rhetorical move to to reframe the founding. You know, I'm particularly thinking of the the anti-slavery constitutionalism argument that mm -hmm. starts to emerge around then, you know, are these the same people sort of making some political argument about the, about the founding that goes beyond just Jefferson? Um, to some degree though, I would, I think that this, the stuff with Jefferson more, it's lineage is sort of older. And I think it goes back to, um, a, I mean, in the, in the wake of the American Revolution, you have the Northern Emancipation, you have, and you have a lot of African Americans having to fight to actually achieve freedom under, under gradual emancipation. You know, that's, you have a kind of anti-slavery movement that, that takes shape around actually securing emancipation in the North. And within the context of that movement, within these struggles to actually achieve to actually free people in the North, you have a lot of people invoking black service in the American Revolution, the American Revolutionary principles, this sort of American argument for why blacks in the North should be free. And I feel, feel like, um, you know, in the 1820s, these are the kind of arguments that African Americans bring also into um, arguments against colonization. The American Colonization Society gets going in 1817. So that among African Americans, the emphasis is on the revolutionary tradition. Um, the Constitution is perhaps not as prominent as the Declaration of Independence in this early period. Um, though it will later become more prominent as, as sort of the fights over what, you know, what the country stand for. I, I feel like um, that's actually a really good question when the constitution becomes kind of more prominent, but I feel like the white abolitionists might be more, I mean, that becomes also an issue, you know, among the Garrisonians versus the political abolitionists um, and um, it, uh, the sort of, genealogy that argument may be slightly different among African Americans, though it's a really good question. It's something I need to think more about. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, Andrew Fagel. Is that your last pronounce your last name, Andrew? Turn your turn that your down. Yeah, that uh, that is how you uh, pronounce my last name. Oh, good. All uh, right. So. Uh, Mia, I'm a I'm an editor with the Jefferson Papers uh, just up the road in Princeton. Oh, okay, um, great. And I I liked your talk a lot. Um, longtime Jefferson scholar, new to topic of slavery uh, with him. And I'm I had a fan, new caller, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, two uh, two things came to mind uh, with your talk, and that's one has ha, have any of the black authors that you've looked at. Mm -hmm. Have they ever referenced Jefferson's appointment of Levy Lincoln as his attorney general? Um, and if not, why not? Because it seems to me that Jefferson's appointment of the lawyer who successfully argued for Quack Walker's freedom um, might merit some commentation. And if it didn't, why does that drop out of the anti-slavery slash abolitionist viewpoint of Jefferson and slavery in this period? And the second question is, have you come across Thomas Harris of Connecticut's uh, 1804 letter to Jefferson? Um, I linked to it in the, the Founders Online, I linked to it in the chat. Uh, and it's a letter that I worked on um, my first year at the Jefferson Papers uh, from a former slave in Connecticut uh, to Jefferson, uh, announcing that he's naming his recently born twins, uh, Thomas and Jefferson, uh, in part because you know, I, I quoted it here, Jefferson is the friend of freedom and equal rights, the benefactor of mankind and of people of color in particular. And so from that, you know, how, how might Thomas Harris's viewpoint shape your view of how African-Americans were viewing Jefferson uh, other than the anonymous letter from a slave from 1808? Right, well, I mean, to, to go with your second question first, I have not come across the Thomas Harris letter, and I thank you for drawing attention to it. You said it was where? It's on- uh, It's in volume 43 of the Jefferson Papers, um, and it's up on both Founders Online and Rotunda, our online uh, platform. Okay. Uh, and I, I provided a link in the, uh, the chat function. Wonderful, um, we'll email you. it to you. Um, but no, it, it sounds intriguing, and, and it, it it's sort of a very early evidence of, what I see more commonly later is this kind of very positive, like this tendency to invoke a very sort of positive assessment of Jefferson um, among Blacks. I'll have to try to find out more about it to see if there's anything beyond that I can say about Harris. I, um, and to answer your second question, I have not seen any reference to Levy Lincoln. Um, there are recently more and more Annabelle and Black newspapers or online, um, it, I, I will keep digging, but I have not come across anything. And, and that is an interesting question though. I don't know how well known this was among African-Americans. No. I mean, I get no sense that it was. I mean, Andrew, are you sure, is it, is it Levy or Levi? I don't know, is, he's not that famous in general among anyone, is he? I mean, no, it's kind I mean, of advanced that, level and Lincoln's attorney, uh, Jefferson's attorney general is kind of advanced knowledge. Yeah, I mean, well, so we, we, we call him Levy, um, but he could be he could be Levi. We've had internal debates. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the kind of thing his newspaper, the the Argus in the Worcester Argus, Aegis, it survived. National Aegis, right, or the National Aegis, yeah. Um, but his papers have mostly been lost. Yeah. So we see from his interactions with Jefferson that he's in the room where things are happening. And Jefferson has a lot of marginal notations from Lincoln, but not as much of the correspondence might survive uh, as we would like. Um, so, you know, he's somewhat marginal, but he's only marginal because of that lack of primary source evidence. That we would all want. Well, I, yeah, I didn't mean. I mean, we should, we shouldn't, we should, we should get out of the weeds and let somebody else answer. Are there any other student questions? I have a little cue here, but is there any other student questions before you can, you could, student can can jump in? And if and if not, then uh, Bill, Bill Thompson, are you still there? I am. I'll be there. Hi. Hi. Uh, 
Uh, I was wondering why people assume that uh, Jefferson's ideals are reflected in the Declaration. Uh, why isn't he just a lawyer writing a petition on behalf of his clients? Uh, his notes uh, are clearly his own work, and we'd be more reflective of his own individual ideals. So why are people assuming that the Declaration reflects his ideals? Well, I mean, that, that, is a, that is a good question, especially since a lot of what's in the Declaration you can sort of find in other documents from that time period. Um, but um, Jefferson also does make other anti-slavery pronouncements, which are picked up and quoted by, you know, people I tremble for this country when I, you know, remember that God is just, um, you know, his sort of, he expresses these wishes about anti-slavery. Um, it's, I think it gets read a little bit, you know, I mean, it, it gets read a little bit backward into the Declaration of Independence or it gets read by people who want to see it there. But I, you know, I, I think you're right that, you know, it, it doesn't provide dispositive evidence <laughs> that this is what he thinks or, or is committed to. He's only 33 and at the time he writes the Declaration, he's a member of a committee. Yeah, he, and he's a member of a committee and he's, and he's also, they're also trying to, I mean, they're also trying to create a big tent. I mean, you don't want to, you don't, you want, they're trying to mobilize people around the revolution. So, and they're, you know, and they're trying to create a good impression for the world at large. So, you know, there's no reason to take, I mean, there's no reason to take this as his deep pers personally held views, but as he becomes the icon of American democracy, that's the way a lot of people begin to take it. Well, then on you both sides of the story, you even have Southerners who reject the Declaration of Independence sure. and reject Thomas Jefferson because of it. Bill, he put it on his own gravestone, though, right? Yeah. Well, he, I mean, yeah, he put so it on his own gravestone, which Bill knows because it's like right outside the building. Yeah. So he, he well, also doesn't wonder, back away from it either. either. <laughs> What I'm talking about are the people at that time who are re who are reacting to him. Well, because I mean, his supporter, his supporters took constantly took credit. I mean, I know, of course I mean, they so, did. So, so, so that I mean, it was promoted. So that's where everyone's reacting. Yeah, but uh, why would African Americans take it that way when, in fact, all of his other writings really don't uh, reach that ideal? Well, I would say that his other writings contain en enough, just enough for them to try to, I mean, to try to kind of evoke an anti-slavery Thomas Jefferson. He has, I mean, he's, he gives them more fodder to work with than a lot of other leaders. Um, and, you know, I think it's, I think it's strategic. No, I, you know? I agree with that, a useful tool, I agree. Yeah. Well, okay, let's say, let's, let's, uh, uh, Thanks, Bill. Uh, Dan Mandel. Oh, and you. Dan's Hi. in the mountains. Thank you very much for your presentation, and I look forward to reading more of the work as it develops, continues. Um, I'm actually, my question actually kind of brings you even more forward in time. I was wondering, given these different views of, of, uh, of Jefferson, um, whether Jefferson became, as an image, as an idea, became part of the debate between Dubois and Washington mm. um, during that conflict between the two. Um, did, have you run into that at all? I have not. Um, and, um, in, in fact, I mean, there... As far as I know, there. I mean, I, I, should, I should double check further, but uh, I feel like that is sort of an example of the ways in which Jefferson doesn't loom all that large in Black thought after emancipation. Um, they don't kind of talk about him that much. I've seen much more debate over, you know, what Lincoln did or did not do for African Americans than Jefferson's views about slavery. Um, though I should, I should double check. You kind of think Du Bois would have something to say about Jefferson. Can I then ask the follow-up question, which is, at, does Jefferson at some point then re-enter African-American discourse? 
And if so, why and how? Well, I think he, I mean, I think he definitely re-enters with Martin Luther King, who's, who's sort of, you know, invokes him as an, for, in defending the, you know, defending him, defending himself against accusations of being an extremist. Um, and then I haven't spent a lot of time with him, but I also feel like Obama talks about Thomas Jefferson a fair bit. Um, and uh, this is, again, something I haven't really gotten to, but I, I think there is an argument for looking at it more closely. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Okay, let's see. let's see. I think I see. J okay, now we're starting. Now, uh, well, of course, now now the questions are now the questions are flying. Uh, let's let me jump ahead to a student, Claire. Hi, thank you so much uh, for this discussion today. And I was curious how you would recommend approaching contextualizing Thomas Jefferson for people in academia. And also, if you think um, historians can bring something different to the conversation today about Thomas Jefferson that we might be missing. Um, well, I think that, um, good question. Um, I think that we, we need to think, I mean, for a long time, this, this discussion about Jefferson actually has not really included Black views of him. So I think we need to think more about those um, and more about the ways in which the American tradition is something that um, many groups are sort of participating in crafting and tweaking and and how, um, I mean, when I first, when I was writing my first book and spending a lot of time reading about African-American thought, a lot of the focus of stuff on African-American thought was on black nationalism, what blacks thought of Africa and so forth. And one of my big surprises as a student going into the archives, back when people entered the archives, yeah, <laughs> was, those were the days, wasn't they? was, um, you know, just how much of, 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 how much of 19th century black thought was about the United States and about American symbols and what the meaning of America was. So I think that um, in terms of looking at Jefferson, we have to, you know, we, we have to think about not just, you know, where he stands in white thought, but what other members of, how uh, members of other groups kind of use him and how the American tradition is something that is, um, crafted across the lines of race um, and, and um, you know, and it is, it is, I mean, maybe that should also make us think about, you know, in these debates over statues and stuff, like, you know, not getting rid of the past entirely, but instead kind of interrogating the relationship that different groups have had to some of these figures. Yeah, thank you so much. And my um, roommates who actually don't study history were like coming in and out as you're giving your presentation. And we were all saying how we hadn't heard this perspective that you brought in this talk today. So thank you so much again for being here. Today. Thank you. Yeah, we have the, the Jefferson has been officially contextualized. Uh, 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 so I think I can see about three more here. And then I think we'll let, let's, we'll let, let Mia, let, let Mia uh, uh, walk her dog or whatever she needs to do. <laughs> uh, 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 Jay. Sexton. Hi, yeah, I really enjoyed the paper. Thank you. Um, my, my question really is, uh, actually picks up on what you were just saying about how the American tradition is pluralistic and there's a lot of different perspectives kind of weaving in together. Uh, uh, of course, you know, J Jefferson um, already in, in this period in the early 19th century is, I mean, he's probably not a, a global figure, but he's an Atlantic figure. Mm -hmm. He's known um, outside of the United States, and and of course it's the the Declaration um, that 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 circulates most prominently. But as you say, some of his uh, the, the notes on Virginia, of course, published outside of America, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. Um, I guess my my question uh, really is about uh, black people outside of the United States, and if the, if there's any anything there, do, do do they see in 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 Jefferson something that um, provides an opportunity to uh, comment upon or to advance their their political agenda. So, non america outside of America, uh, black people, is there a story? Is there a story there? I think there might be. A this is something I'm just beginning to research. But I recently discovered that um, 
the Haitian leader, uh, Dessaline, wrote to Jefferson, was like, oh. you know, this is our, it's in our revolution, <laughs> like trying to get him on board with the idea that the Haitian revolution was like the American revolution. So I want to look further into that and, you know, try to see if there's um, other discourse coming out of Haiti or possibly other places. But that, that's research I haven't done yet, but I would like to include more if I can find anything beyond Dessaline. Is this Dessaline in the Jefferson Papers? Is that in the Jefferson Papers? I don't know where it is. Someone just mentioned it to me. Oh, the Andrew, the Jefferson, pa Andrew, the Jefferson Papers the guy just gave a thumbs up. So it must yeah. be. We, uh, okay. Yeah, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> okay. Okay, they're, they're, they're on it. Um, yeah, there, there were some good footnotes in that one about the guy from Connecticut too. I, uh, that's, that, looks, that looks good. Uh, let's see, two, two more questions. Jeff McConnell, I, I don't know. Thank you so much um, for having, giving me the opportunity to visit. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bay, for your lecture. I, my question was, and I think you explained it once, but I just was, I needed to maybe get a better uh, explanation for me because I'm, I'm slower than most. Uh, could you reiterate the reason why uh, you think that Jefferson's flawed character really was an advantage for people who you know, for abolitionists and, and for anti, for anti uh, slavery folks. That, that, would, that was intriguing to me. And I'm curious as to if you could explain it a little bit further. Well, because I think that they could both, I mean, anti slavery folks could both um, express admiration for the sort of principles on which he had founded American democracy and, and also, but also not you know, not pretend that these principles were actually working, you know, like that Jefferson had made all these claims, but, but the, you know, much of it had not been established um, so that um, there, could, there could be a critique of Jefferson as someone who has kind of laid out a blueprint for this great society, but had not actually made it work or fully committed to all the things you would do to, to make it actually realized. Does that make, does that, is that helpful? Yeah, it, it, I mean, I guess the notion that, okay, we can see in Jefferson the fact that what he says and what he do, does are two different things. And as a right. result, perhaps he's as human as the rest of us are. And if we're going to move in this direction, well, we can see, okay, this guy, you know, he's, right. he's not out on a, on a pyramid, you know, not, not so far away, we can't relate to him. Is that? Yeah, and then also that American society is not I mean, the, the thing was, American society is not a great society. It's a potentially great society that was founded on great principles, um, you know, um, and, and this was sort of a better count, you know, better than saying it was, I mean, it was a, there was a, you know, debate among the abolitionists about whether it's founded on great principles, whether it's, you know, whether the Constitution is pro-slavery or not, but African-Americans often come down on the, it was founded on great principles argument um, because, you know, it, I think they see it as a way in which African-Americans can write themselves into American democracy as people, um, you know, who should have been protected under the founding and were not because of the, you know, failings of people like Jefferson, but it's like never too late to correct these original errors. Yeah, holding the principle higher than the, the acts themselves. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, that's a that's a a, a, a you know a, a principle that a principle that I'm often spoken sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see, Billy Coleman. Hi. Well, you get the finale, Bill, Billy. This is it. The big. This is the big finale. All right. I'll uh, I'll do my best. Um, yeah. I, I'll reiterate that. Like, yeah. This was uh, a, a super interesting talk, and and really enjoyed it. Thank um, you. One thing that I was thinking about was, I guess, whether, and this is kind of building on Jeff's question, um, whether some of the contradictions that Jefferson had that appealed to abolitionists had anything to do with the extent to which appealing to those contradictions could allow, I guess, ab black abolitionists with different ideas about the best tactics for abolition mm -hmm. um, to, you know, be able to do either one, right? Like if you want to you know, support moral suasion is the right way. You can appeal to Jefferson. Um, if you want to support um, violent resistance as a way to go about it, you can, you know, support 
you can appeal to Jefferson um, in, in different ways, but you know, it allows that kind of malleability to work or whether in fact, maybe there's just, you know, different black abolitionists at different points who support different tactics, potentially uh, relate to Jefferson in different ways. Um, and then I guess just since it is the finale, um, maybe there is a, a connection there to contextualizing uh, Jefferson now when it comes to um, Black Lives Matter or police brutality um, and, and how people appeal to him in that kind of 21st century context. Wow, that's an interesting question. I, I feel like I haven't heard people appealing to Thomas Jefferson in the context of Black Lives Matter, though that, that would be really interesting if, if they did. Um, but I, I take your point about um, I think I think that is another re yet another reason why he's useful to African Americans because he you know his ideas can be invoked in different ways to support direct you know like a David a David Walker can use them in support of um, revolution or um, other thinkers can use them in support on the sort of character of the origins or moral suasion um, you know in many ways Jefferson's Jefferson kind of lays out almost every sort of possible, his career lays out all kinds of possible approaches to what's going on and people can use him as they, as they will. So I think that's why he's useful to African-Americans. That's why he's useful to many Americans in sort of discussing American society and what it should stand for. Um, um, what he means to people today and you know like whether he sort of attracts black lives matter people or who his constituency to is today if if any is a really interesting question which i'm not sure i know the answer to but i welcome other people's answers about it i, I wouldn't say there's a whole lot of evidence at least around here that there's a lot of uh, black lives matter uh, people who find jefferson useful yeah well yeah <laughs> it's, 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 it's so, so that's 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 a but that but i hope you know this this may this 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 talk may may spark some food for thought and i think with that uh i would just like to thank uh unless there, anybody has got anything else i'd just like to thank uh mia bay so much and now everybody's sound is on turn your sound and give me a hand thank you and really uh, enjoyed talking to you guys. Now we're, now we're